Welcome. As we gather this evening for the 20th annual Augustine College Hymn Sing, we're delighted to be here once again in the Church of St. Barnabas, Apostle and Martyr, with our former professor, Wesley Warren, up where he regularly is perched, up at the organ, pouring forth wondrous music to accompany us as we sing tonight. You should all have in hand as you begin a leaflet with the order of the program in it. You'll also need the blue hymn book that's in your pew for the hymns. All the numbers refer to that. And because all of it follows along in the leaflet, we shouldn't have to interrupt the flow of it as we go along until we get to the end. Tonight's focus is on the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father, as it is often called, the Pater Noster in Latin, surely the most universal of Christian prayers. Whatever your denominational background, chances are pretty good that if I were to start praying, as I will in another minute or two, Our Father who art in heaven, that you would be able to join in with me even without looking at the back of your leaflet. These are words given by Jesus in response to his apostles' request that he teach them to pray, even as John the Baptist had taught his disciples. Some argue that they present simply a model for the kind of prayer we ought to pray, covering the basis of praise, petition, and penitence. Others maintain that these represent the very words of Jesus as he desired them to be prayed by his disciples that it is incumbent upon us in humble obedience to offer them regularly in most, if not all, of our services of worship. Regardless, the petitions, the petitions are worthy of much thought and reflection, rather than simply letting them slide off the tongue in rapid fashion, which is not to say that there might not be value in that as well, but more fruit comes with time and attention. Jesus invites us to begin by addressing our Father. We share the intimacy of the our with him. My Father and your Father. My God and your God. And undergirding that, we might discern the even more intimate and heartfelt Abba. The child's simple address to the Father. If he is our Father, then we are his children sons and daughters with Jesus. That's to shape our attitude of prayer, to form our hearts. So let us enter in with Jesus this evening that he might teach us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 5 to 15. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that, they're, pardon me, they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, Neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. The word of the Lord. 
As we've already heard, the prayer that we're meditating on this evening comes to us in the context of other teachings of Christ, which we call the Sermon on the Mount. Christ is describing the kingdom of God and what it means to be a citizen of this kingdom. And he gives us this prayer as a means not only of instructing us, but also of molding us after himself. As Father Doug has suggested, Jesus begins in his mercy by inviting us to know God as he knows him. In calling us to pray, Our Father, Christ is offering us what only he is able to offer. He is, by his very nature, the Son of God, and by grace we too can call God Father. We pray the Lord's Prayer as people seeking to know God as Christ knows him, seeking to know God as Father. We pray in order to become like the one who is the perfect image of the Father. We pray in the confident hope that he is making us sons. And we move from this bold proclamation of sonship to the humbling recognition that the one we call Father is in heaven. When Christ teaches us to pray to God who is in heaven, he is not, I think, encouraging us to think of God as removed from our lives here and now. But he is rather, it seems to me, insisting that we pray in light of the knowledge that the one to whom we pray is everlasting. He is the King Eternal, the King of Heaven. As the words of our next hymn proclaim, the King of Heaven is one with the power to ransom, to heal, restore, forgive, to show mercy and favor, to chide and to bless, to tend and spare us, to bear us and to rescue us. It is he who made us and he alone is able to remake us, to make us citizens of his eternal kingdom, to fit us for heaven. When we pray to our Father in Heaven, we are both proclaiming who God is and taking on the posture of those who want to know him better. We are transformed when we pray these words. We are becoming sons of God, citizens of his heavenly kingdom. We are learning to pray as Christ himself. The first petition we bring before God when we pray as Christ prays follows naturally from an understanding of who God is. Hallowed be thy name. We pray that his name, his character, his very self will be hallowed. This is an odd thing to pray. What does it mean to ask God to make his own name holy? We are asking God to do what only he can do. We are asking him to allow his holiness to be known and proclaimed throughout the world. We are asking him to make us creatures capable of proclaiming his name, of drawing all creation into praise of the one who is holy. We are asking him to restore us to our true purpose of hallowing his name. And when we pray these strange words that are at once a request and a command, we are both praising the one whose name is hallowed and praying that the Holy One will make us fit to hallow his name. When we pray, hallowed be thy name, we are seeking to be those who say yes to what truly and eternally is. We are saying amen to the great I am. Christ calls us to pray in this way, both to instruct us and to fashion us after his own likeness. He is calling us to pray as he himself prays, to God as Father, the King of Heaven, the holy name whose image we bear. As we pray this prayer, we are, by his grace, becoming ever more like the one who teaches us to pray.
I have been offered for reflection the words, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Three phrases, which part to talk about. First is the idea of a kingdom and one that is the Father's. In a moment we will sing, the Lord is King. What is this kingdom? Then comes the idea of God's will and the doing of his will. And then in the last part is the parallel of earth and heaven. And let's start there. There is an implicit contrast here. A defect is implied, presumed. We are asked to pray that earth would become like heaven. It's certainly not like heaven now. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, or may what is going on in heaven be done also on earth. We are asked to pray that earth might match what is in heaven. Speaking on these words of this prayer, John Chrysostom in the fourth century said that Jesus is asking us to long for heaven and the things in heaven. However, even before heaven, he has asked us to make the earth a heaven. In fact, this is really the sense of each of those three phrases. Thy kingdom come. This is a heavenly kingdom and we are to pray that it comes. Where? On earth. That it did so would be God's will. And third, earth and heaven would be made alike. We are praying that the will of the Father be done as it is in heaven. This is certainly saying, may the will of the Father be done on earth, since it is done in heaven. But is that the meaning of the words? And notice that we're given words. We have to understand them before we can pray them. If we pray this line that way, may the will of the Father be done on earth, just as, by the way, it is done in heaven, we're missing the key thing. The reference to heaven is not secondary like that. The whole prayer began, Our Father who art in heaven. Chrysostom says that the Lord's Prayer is meant to tear us away from the earth and put us with our Father in heaven. Quote, But when he says in heaven, he speaks not this as shutting up God there, but as withdrawing him who is praying from earth and fixing him in the high places and in the dwellings above. When we pray that the will of the Father be done on earth as it is in heaven, we are really giving our response as Mary gave a response to Gabriel to God's invitation to be creatures in heaven. Now, to be in heaven now, on earth. That other way of reading this, may the will of the Father be done on earth, since it is done in heaven, does not quite get us up to this astonishing perspective on this prayer. To pray the Lord's Prayer with this understanding is to ask that we would be permitted to enter heaven now. If that's the case, then the daily bread that comes further on is perhaps not the sustenance we need to live on this earth, since the prayer is not about earth, except in a very particular way, as potentially open to heaven. And what, by the way, did Jesus say his food was? He said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. If the Lord's Prayer is a prayer to enter heaven now in our lives, what then is heaven? I've sometimes asked that question at the college in the classroom, apropos of something we are discussing in class. By the way, what is heaven? I don't think anyone has yet answered where the will of God is done. But if you think about this prayer and the number of times any Christian prays it, do you not think that that point should be firmly set into our consciousness by the words, thy will be done on earth as it is in, he in heaven? Which means, doesn't it, 
that that is what heaven is. It is the place where the will of God is done, says this central prayer of the faith. The usual reflex is to say that heaven is where we are going, where we will be in eternity, which means heaven for us is beyond our deaths. But why do we not hear the words we are praying? The Lord's Prayer is a prayer to enter heaven, the place where the will of God is done now in our life signs. Chrysostom asks, when he hath removed us from earth and fixed us in heaven, when God has used the words of this prayer, Chrysostom is saying, to shift our focus to heaven, let us see, Chrysostom writes, what he commands us to ask after this. And the answer is that we would become saints, be fully Christ-like, says Chrysostom, for there is nothing to hinder our reaching the perfection of the powers above. Though we inhabit the earth, it is possible, even while abiding here, to do all as though already placed on high. What God writes into this prayer, therefore, is this, he says, as in heaven all things are done without hindrance, and the angels are not partly obedient and partly disobedient, but in all things yield and obey, so grant that we men may not do thy will by halves, but perform all things as thou willest. Do God's will here, now, wholly. And it seems prudent to wonder if perhaps Jesus hasn't told us that we will not be going to heaven after we die if we have not reached heaven in this life. If the Lord's Prayer is a prayer that we would be permitted to enter heaven now, that is, that we would be made righteous, not counted righteous, but perfected, turned into a person who does God's will, not by halves, as I do, but with the perfection of Christ. You therefore must be perfect, said Jesus, as your heavenly Father is perfect. If that is what Jesus told us to ask for, then in praying his prayer, we are supposed to be stealing ourselves to be vastly different, opening ourselves to a radical transformation now. And so the prayer moves on to some of the pivotal things we will have to get around to, the forgiveness of others, the resistance of temptations we have failed to resist. One closing thought, returning to Chrysostom's remark that Jesus has asked us to make earth a heaven. Earlier in his sermon, Chrysostom had quoted Jesus' injunction to let your light so shine before men, etc. We might be inclined to say that God has called us to make the earth a heaven, but it is worth registering that in this prayer, Jesus told us to pray this would happen. If we could just do it, transform the culture in all the other ways we put this, why pray for it? We pray that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven, because we know very well, or should, since we worship Christ, that we, in the way we live, are not fit to accomplish any such thing. What light? How could I call God Father? If any such thing as God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven could ever come to pass, it is going to be by Christ going forth on this earth through people who are very different from me, who think differently, act differently, are utterly different, who are very much like him. To pray that the earth would be made a heaven is to pray, says Chrysostom, that error may be destroyed and truth implanted and all wickedness cast out and virtue return and there be no difference in this respect between heaven and earth. I would have to be a fool 
to think that I could go out and add my little bit of virtue and my tiny bit of wisdom to the world, along with thousands of other Christians doing the same and have an effect such as that. Ideas have conscious consequences and with good ideas gradually the world will wake up and it will never happen. If you pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, you are praying, as Professor Martin said, to be fit for this task that God's will for the world might be done, since you are the world. Chrysostom offers a caution here. Christ did not at all say, thy will be done in me or in us, but everywhere on the earth. But for that to be accomplished, we are indeed praying that heaven would reach us, because we are not there yet, in heaven, among those doing the will of God. And the world will not be like heaven through people such as we are. In this line of the prayer, it seems to me, is the essence of what we are praying for in the Lord's Prayer. Says Chrysostom, to be able to call God Father is the profession of a blameless life. If I do not pray the Lord's Prayer as a prayer to be transformed and enter heaven, in my lifetime, then what is it I am asking for in saying these words?
move on in the petitions, give us this day our daily bread. What are we asking of the Lord? The most obvious sense of the petition appears to be a desire for physical food, something to sustain us through this day. And certainly there's nothing wrong with that, for our bodies do require food to stay alive. It's not wrong to pray for such tangible needs. However, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told his disciples that they could trust their Heavenly Father in this regard, even as do the birds of the air, who do not fret about such things, but simply get on with doing what God has made them for, doing what he gives them to do. They need their food, as do we, but their greater need, and ours, is to grow in trust of God's word and to focus upon knowing and doing his will. Scripture regularly points us beyond the physical appearances of things to their spiritual heart and what God offers us there. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy, says the Lord through his prophet Isaiah. Hearken diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in fatness. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live and I will make you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. In contrast to the bread that does not satisfy is the call of God to hear his word, to come to him, to feed on that which he alone can give. There's a more, there is a more substantial and enduring food which God alone can supply. In fact, St. Jerome, in his Vulgate Latin translation of Scripture, rendered the relevant passage, petition of the Our Father as, give us this day our super substantial bread, super substantialis. As Jesus declared, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him has the Father set his seal. During their 40 years in the wilderness, Israel was sustained physically by the daily rain of manna, a daily bread supplied by God's own hand. Yet as they prepared to enter the promised land, Moses exhorted them to recognize that their true sustenance was not to be found there. Everything that they had 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 or could trust in had been stripped away, not simply to substitute other things for them, but to teach them to trust and feed upon God's word at all times and in all things. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but that man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. They were to live even as we are to live, by receiving and feeding upon the word of God. And that word became flesh and dwelt among us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Further, he is the true and living bread which sustains unto eternal life. Surely at its heart our petition for daily bread is about receiving and feeding upon him all that Jesus offers us of his very self. Just following on those thoughts from Dr. Tingley, we can't do it of our own, not by our efforts, not by our righteousness. We only live that will of God, that kingdom life, as we are with Jesus, in Jesus, living by him. The true bread which comes down from heaven. Lord, give us this bread always. Give us this day our daily bread.
Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those for them that trespass against us. What a bold and risky prayer this is. We ask not for grace to forgive in a manner in keeping with God how God has forgiven us, surely a worthy and challenging standard, but rather we invite him to forgive us according to the standard by which we forgive. Do we really want that? How well do you forgive? I'm not sure that I want to be forgiven only as well or as often or as completely as I forgive. Perhaps there's someone I or you ought to forgive even this very minute, even tonight before you go to bed. It certainly bears thinking about. Now some might soften it to suggest that we're just asking that because we do manage in some imperfect measure to overlook others' failings and the wrongs which they, they have done to us, well, at least some of the time, that therefore we are asking that God might forgive us whatever we have done in turn. The mere fact that we have forgiven someone ought to at least set precedent for God, who after all is better at this than we are, to forgive us. However, in the context of, context of our Lord's teaching on these matters, it seems clear to me that he has some kind of equivalent standard in mind. When he told his parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18, he ended with the words, So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. That sounds a lot more like forgive us in like manner to how we forgive. There are always in this gospel pattern of forgiveness two motivations for forgiving others. The first is because we have been forgiven a debt which we could never repay, that of our sins and the separation between us and God. We were dead and have been raised to life. We were lost and now we're found. The gap has been bridged by the sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus, and we are invited to receive of him that forgiveness and to share what we have been given. In Matthew 18, in that parable, we encounter the servant who owed an astronomical debt, which is unimaginably forgiven by his master. Thereafter, it's clear that everything that the servant could have collected from his own debtors, the people who owed him money, would have been forfeit to his master since he hadn't had the means to pay. Accordingly, his own forgiveness freed him up to let their debts go in turn, which, of course, if you remember the story, is exactly what he chose not to do. We can go through the particular story if you don't have it in mind. After being forgiven, he goes out and finds a servant who owes him a relatively small amount of money and demands that the debt be repaid. When he's asked for time, he actually throttles the man and throws him in prison until he shall pay the last penny. The other side of things, the other motivation comes into play with his response. It's that we need to forgive in order to be forgiven, or if you like, to truly receive and retain what God has offered to us, what he's already extended to us. In keeping with what I was speaking with about with the students in chapel yesterday, we only f receive the fullness of God's gifts when we really let them flow not only into our lives, but through our lives as well. That when we try to grasp and clutch to ourselves what God has given to us, it diminishes, dries up, or at least fails to bear the intended fruit. It's as we open our hands to release his blessings unto others that he is able to refill them. As we empty out the vaults within that are full of all those things which we hold against the others, our hearts are free to be filled, not only to be filled, but to be healed in the deepest depths by the divine forgiveness and the glorious liberty of the children of God. 
but then another way. Only then do we open ourselves that heaven might take root in us, that we might submit ourselves to the will of God, again flowing into and through our lives. So with much trepidation, with deep humility and a further plea for the Spirit's conviction, cleansing and discernment, we offer once more the petition, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, or deliver us from the evil one. A striking conclusion, despite or perhaps because of how simple it is. At face value, the meaning of this clause is that we are faced with a stark contrast between what the oldest Christian text outside the New Testament namely the Didache, calls the two ways. There are two ways, says the Didache, one of life and one of death, but a great difference between the two ways. 
The way of life, then, is this. First, you shall love God who made you, and second, love your neighbor as yourself. And do not do to another what you would not want, what you would not want done unto you. A little later, the author passes on to speak about the way of death. Just in case you were wondering, the way of death is this. First of all, it is evil and accursed, murders, adultery, lust, fornication, thefts, idolatry, magic arts, witchcrafts, rape, false witness, hypocrisy, double-heartedness, deceit, haughtiness, depravity. Self-will, greediness, filthy talking, jealousy, overconfidence, loftiness, boastfulness, persecutors of the good, hating truth, loving a lie, not knowing a reward for righteousness, not cleaving to good nor to righteous judgment, watching not for that which is good, but for that which is evil. From whom meekness and endurance are far, loving vanities, pursuing revenge, not pitying a poor man, not laboring for the afflicted, not knowing him who made them, murderers of children, destroyers of the handiwork of God, turning away from him who is in want, afflicting him who is distressed, advocates of the rich, lawless judges of the poor, utter sinners. Be delivered, children, from all these." Unquote. So perhaps the Lord is simply teaching us to pray that we be spared from the way of death and kept in the way of life. And yet we might ask on second thought whether it's strange that we ask the Lord to not lead us into temptation as if he would. James, after all, tells us in the first chapter of his epistle, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Hence the common alternative translation to that of the King James, which we all know so well. And this alternative seems to better reflect the Greek, although Jesus would, of course, have been praying in Aramaic. Save us from the time of trial. One scholar of Semitic languages argues that indeed the original Aramaic would have translated something like, do not allow us to enter into wrong thinking or testing. So if we are asking God to prevent us from evil, both in the sense of restraining us and the now archaic sense of going before us, to restrain us from following our own worst inclinations, and to go before us so as to block the way when we do follow those inclinations, what then is our responsibility? Is it simply God's job to help us avoid temptation? Are we asking him, that is, to overrule our own freedom, that most precious of gifts which he has given us? For there are indeed instances when we choose to be put to the test, we misuse our freedom. Then, to be sure, we need divine grace to prevent us, both before and behind. We pray then, I think, for him to overrule our freedom when our misuse of that freedom would threaten our growth in holiness. But there are also times when surely we should be put to the test. The Lord himself, after all, was driven into the wilderness by the Spirit in order to be tested. And, of course, was tested to his limits, even beyond his limits, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Tertullian tells us, the Lord himself, when he had wished to demonstrate to us, even in his own flesh, the flesh's infirmity, by the reality of suffering, said, Father, remove your cup. And remembering himself, added, But not my will, but thine be done. He himself was the will of the Father, says Tertullian. 
and the power of the Father, and yet for the demonstration of the patience which was due, he gave himself up to the Father's will. Cyprian of Carthage similarly says, Power is given against us in two modes, either for punishment, when we misuse our freedom, or for glory, when we are proved, as we see was done with respect to Job. As God himself sets forth, saying, All that he has I give unto your hands, but be careful not to touch himself. Job, of course, being taken as a figure of Christ, who also was put to the test for the sake of glory. So it seems that even this petition to not be put to the test has to defer to that which comes earlier in the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Lead us not into temptation until and unless it be your will to do so. And deliver us from evil until and unless it be your will, Lord, that we should suffer. Suffer what seems to us and perhaps to others to be evil, to be the work of the evil one, and yet... It may be the will of the Lord that we suffer that. As Jesus said, let this cup pass from me, deliver me from this time of testing. But not my will, but thine be done. Or as the psalmist says, into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. You have redeemed me, O God, the God of truth. We pray then for the peace that passes understanding. So that whether the Father does not bring us to the test, or whether he causes us to pass through it, we will arrive through his power in the glory of his kingdom. St. Cyprian of Carthage says, When we say, deliver us from evil, therefore, there remains nothing further which ought to be asked. When we have once asked for God's protection against evil and have obtained it, then against everything which the devil and the world would work against us, we stand secure and safe. For what fear is there in this life to the man whose guardian in this life is God?
So we come to an end. Although given that what we led into was reflection on the Lord's Prayer and because it forms so much a part of so many of our lives, it's hopefully a beginning of more fruitful praying, more thoughtful reflection. Thank you to all who took part this night, whether offering reflections, providing music, giving attention, singing along, preparing refreshments, or looking after other physical arrangements, whatever. There will be a, a basket or two that's around somewhere that I don't know if we arranged for hands to pass them. If we did, then that will be passed about just if there are those who'd like to make donations to the college this night. Everyone is invited regardless into the hall for a reception following the program. It's an opportunity for the fellowship to be refreshed physically. Um, also a chance to meet some of the students from this year's class and some of the faculty and others if you don't know them. But a chance to get together and just to relax a little. God grant that we may come to him this night in the intimacy of children before their heavenly and loving Father. May we come to Jesus in him and by him, blessed by the Holy Spirit, drawn into their communion of perfect love, enabled thereby not only to say, but to live the words which Jesus has taught us. In the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, be upon you and remain with you this night and forevermore. Amen.